Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to now talk about India's transfer pricing dispute, zooming out of the international context and focusing just on one country. Uh, why I'm interested and why all of us should care about this is uh, in 2012, India accounted for a third of global transfer pricing disputes. Uh, it draws the ire of the international community, of businesses, of the entire system, how transfer pricing works. And this paper is sort of interdisciplinary. It tries to build statistics from case laws to show how the system or the institutional machinery <coughs> works and why transfer pricing does not work as well in India. So um, first, to give an economic context of why transfer pricing is important, over the years, uh, if you look, economists can look at it in different ways. One great signal of why there has been an uh, integration with the globe has been the share of value added in uh, gross exports. So it basically says that if a product is made in India, how much of it actually was produced abroad? And you see it's gone up from 10% in early 2000s to about 25% in 2011, uh, which means that there are intercompany transactions. There's another uh, piece of evidence that backs this, is this. Uh, Indian companies have to mandatorily report related party transactions and uh, taking uh, sales between the uh, holding and the subsidiary company, which is just one form of such transaction, you see the proportion, although just about 3%. So this is just one transaction, but of all these sales, 3% are intercompany. And in terms of value as well, it has gone up. Which means that if these companies are indeed uh, ex uh, transacting intercompany, or intra-company, then there would be transfer pricing related issues and there would be consequent disputes. And of course, there are statistics uh, to show that. So uh, India enacted the transfer pricing law in 2001 and the assessments really began in 2004 and 5. And if you look at this graph, you see that the number of cases uh, as well as the value of adjustment has gone up significantly there were about uh, a four-fold increase in the number of audits and, uh, of course, a great increase in the value of adjustment. Now, of course, if there is such an <coughs> increase in adjustments, an SSE is likely to contest it, and uh, therefore there ought to be an increase in the uh, disputes uh, uh, on related to transfer pricing. So, uh, what does transfer pricing uh, dispute mechanism really look in India. Uh, this, uh, this is a long chart of the process. I'm sorry for boring you with the details, but uh, this allows us to assess it uh, specifically or <coughs> various institutions that are involved in the process of. Uh, so essentially, um, an assessee files a return and the assessing officer then audits this. The process of audit has gone through major change. Initially, it used to be revenue thresholds, and now it's risk-based. The assessing officer refers back to the TPO, who is a subject expert, who, who then judges whether uh, there is an adjustment to be made or not to be made. And then what the AO does is present the order to the uh, assessee. Now, the assessee can say, no, um, I, I contested at the draft stage, and go to the dispute resolution panel. Now, the dispute resolution panel was a special uh, adjudicating authority which was created for the purpose of reducing the time of uh, the assessment of the dispute in only 2009. Before that, the other process was to take the draft order, finalize it, and then say, I will dispute it before the <coughs> Commissioner of Income Tax Appeals. Uh, again, there is the assessee is allowed to contest the decision taken by either the dis dispute resolution panel or the Commissioner of Income Tax Appeals, which goes on to the appellate tribunal. And the appellate tribunal is a final fact-finding authority. Any matters of substantive matters of law then proceed to the High Court or the <coughs> Supreme Court. Uh, the interesting thing is that there are two process of processes of appeal for a transfer pricing dispute. This, the Commissioner of Income Tax Appeals is not bound by any time. So he can um, uh, complete the process as and when he, he likes or to his discretion. 
the DRP has to finish the process within <coughs> nine months. And the appellate tribunal, again, is not bound by any time. So uh, this is broadly uh, what the dispute <coughs> process really <coughs> looks like. Any questions I could? Uh <laughs> Sorry, I just maybe I missed it. What's the difference between the cases that go to the CITA and those that go to the DRP? Uh, so um, if it's at the draft stage, uh, a draft order, mm -hmm. you can take it to the dispute resolution panel, mm -hmm. which consists of three commissioners of income tax mm -hmm. who then uh, help the assessees in finalizing the order. And uh, after that, th again, uh, the assessee can contest this. But this is a draft order stage. But if the order is finalized, it could go to the Commissioner Income Tax Appeals and then again goes to the tribunal if there's a dispute. And uh, the, the DRP has to complete it within nine months, whereas the, I, uh, the CITA uh, is not bound. Ideally, they should finish within two years, but uh, it's up to their discretion. Question, please. Uh, the commission uh, is composed of members of the judiciary, then, or is it still tax administration? Because that would <coughs> not make <coughs> sense. Yes, that's a very good point. So both are comprised of the uh, income tax department. So the uh, the uh, in, uh, the appellate tribunal has uh, two members. One is a judicial member, and mm -hmm. one is an accountant member. Mm -hmm. But any process before that comprises only of the income tax department. So why would it be possible that um, either the revenue or the assessee can appeal in one process, but only the assessee in the other, if it's always basically tax administration deciding on the final order? Yes, so um, that process where only the assessee can appeal has gone through a change, uh, three changes. So initially the assessee could appeal against the order of the DRP. It was also a sort of... Um, uh, protecting the institution's decision. So if there are three commissioners of income tax sitting in the DRP, to contest that decision, uh, the revenue to contest that decision is sort of saying that we undermine the decision that the department has taken. But in 2012, the revenue was actually allowed to appeal against the decision. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, <coughs> we went back to this, that <laughs> the assessee, uh, the only, only the assessee can contest uh, the decision. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, just, I think just to clarify, because when it's reading the, it's an alternative. When it's a final order, hmm. you can choose one or the other, right? Uh, no. So if it's a draft order, it okay. goes to the DRP. A final order will go to the CIDA. And is it, is it, sorry, the matter that proceeds to the High Court, is that a judicial review or constitutional? Judicial. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, to give you a broad sense of what my sample looks like, we took about 6,731 case laws, of which, were, uh, which are available <coughs> on the Appellate Tribunal's web page. And we use natural language processing to pick out the specific details on the questions that we hope to ask with our data set. Uh, in India, there are about 30 benches of the tribunal, uh, which is in, it, it, it's in 30 different states. Uh, but predominantly, uh, there are two cities which account for about more than 50% of the cases. And of course, I have a fairly equal amount of cases which went to the DRP and the CIT appeals, which allows me to draw a distinction uh, or to sort of assess whether the alternate dispute resolution mechanism <coughs> really worked or not. And of course, um, a lot of times the appellate tribunal clubs many appeals and decides on them lock, stock, barrel, uh, I've removed that because I can't then do a proper neat clean assessment. Uh, this is very, very cramped, but uh, this is just to give a sense of what the orders look like, uh, what we had to literally scrape through. Uh, typically, you will find the uh, date of hearing and pronouncement over here. Uh, the assessment year to which the, the appeal is related to on top, uh, there were word searches that we did. So, for example, later I'll show wh whether uh, the case after being decided actually went back to the EO for uh, recalculation, and that's why I underlined that word read afresh. Uh, that basically says it's, it went back and then the process started again. And of course, uh, the date of pronouncement and other facts. So, this is just to give you a sense of what the orders uh, really look like. Where did I cut out the information from? 
so uh, i'll be asking mainly three questions one is to say what was the duration did the alternate dis dispute resolution mechanism work and uh, uh, what were the case outcomes so was it a closure or not and who <coughs> wins at what rate so uh, looking at this graph um, the box plot looks at the dispersion of the mean time of the time taken uh, for cases if you look at the beginning of the transfer pricing regime the dispute the, the the dispersion was large and the mean <coughs> was around six years uh, for a case to resolve uh, then as we move in 2007, we see a dip in the median uh, period taken by a case. Of course, still around four years, and then it's static there. So what has happened over the period is that the dispersion in the time taken has shrunk, but after 2007, there's sort of been a stabilization of the average time period taken. And why has this happened? And I do some bit of conjecturing on why this may have happened. So uh, we can split the time period of a case as that before uh, reaching the tribunal and in the tribunal. So uh, we take the assessment here and the year of appeal in the tribunal and then <coughs> from the year of appeal to year of pronouncement and we have two time periods for the case. Why am I doing that? Because I want to see what happens when an assessment order is drawn and then there's a dispute before having reached the tribunal and what is the uh, duration purely for the tribunal to make a decision. So if you look at it, there has been a substantial decline. But where has a substantial <coughs> decline really come from? It is the improvement in the ITAT in making decisions. Again, that 2006-07 where we see the decline in the median time period is when we see the decline for pre ITAT, right? So there may have been administrative reforms. There was also judicial precedence because uh, it was a new system. The assessing officers and the commissioners of income tax did not have enough experience to go back and uh, say, okay, this comparable is good or this is how we decide the profit margins for this sector. But with judicial precedence, we see some improvement, but that tapers off. So um, my one other guess is that we had the dispute resolution panel which was set up in 2009 and the cases which would have arrived at the DRP uh, would have been related to 2006-07 assessment years and that could have in part explained this dip. Okay, um, so starting with the question of whether the dispute resolution, the alternate dispute resolution mechanism really worked, uh, what is this uh, table of statistics really say? It's just a statistical way of saying whether the difference between the two options that I showed you, the Commissioner Income Tax Appeals and the Dispute Resolution Panel, is significantly different. And what this shows is, yes, <coughs> indeed, I mean, there was a year and a half of difference between the time period taken by the two institutions. So, of course, over the entire sample, there is uh, a difference in time. But what really happens if we look at year on year? So this is like splitting the graph on year on year. And uh, as I said, uh, I'm taking the year of appeal here. And if you begin in 2010, when the DRP really started functioning, there was a gap. But this gap tapers off. And there's a closing in of the gap. So which means that the DRP had initial uh, innovation benefits. Uh, the institution worked initially. And then they expanded the staff in the Commission of Income Tax Appeals. There was judicial precedence, and then the gap really closed in. And it could have also been because DRP and CITA. So, one question to ask is if the CIT appeals exist and DRP is there to give you the order in a shorter time, why do people still go to the CIT appeals? And the answer to that is that. Many a times people do not prefer to go to DRP because there are three commissioners of income tax and they take a certain decision which could be adverse to the SSE and they would still like to go through the entire process and uh, try their luck with winning the case. So, so it could be that uh, with expansion <coughs> of CIT appeals, people are still going through the other channel and, uh, uh, and, the, and the duration has been collapsing. Okay. So um, one problematic fact in transfer pricing disputes is that once 
it has reached the tribunal and it's basically a decision on facts whether it's the comparable is correct or the profit margins are correct or uh, the methodology uses appropriate um, the tribunal could actually end the case by saying that they remand the case back to the assessing officer for fresh adjudication which really means that it goes back in the process again if you remember the graph that I had shown initially it goes back to the AO and then it could again start the process of going through appeals and um, we tried to pull that out from our orders the only heartening thing would be that it's about average six and six and a half percent of total number of cases I think for future research it's more important to see what is the size of the value of these cases because six and a half percent but in terms of value if they're huge then it's a, then it's a problem um, the other thing is that the assessing officer is allowed to reopen a case within four years. Now, um, there has been a steady decline in reopening of cases, but yet again, it's about 10%. So it could be that you thought you finally, uh, uh, there's a decision being made, it's over, but the assessing officer reopens it. Uh, this is basically to judge whether there's certainty in the system, right? Because uh, reopening or a remand basically means that you're again in the process and you're not certain what your tax liability related to an assessment year really is. The third, and <coughs> this uh, is the most striking, is that uh, the same assessee goes back into the process on uh, appeal or related to similar issue. So a lot of these cases say that uh, in, in the assessee's own case, uh, this decision or particular decision was taken, which means that uh, the SSC year on year is being taken into dispute on a similar matter. So again, there's a great deal of uncertainty that on repeated transactions you will be assessed or uh, audited. And the incidence is extremely high, 40% of the cases. Uh, you see only a slight dip around 2007 and then it's back to 40%. I think the solution basically is to do block audits. So I believe UK does that as well. So maybe club for three, four years or five years. And this has been a request by business <coughs> for four years. Uh, but the tax department has, so, has not introduced uh, the change so far. Excuse me. Yeah. Is there any evidence of um, greater success or less su greater success for taxpayers? Yes, I'm going to come to that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. That's a question. Do you do you, you issue a lot of advanced pricing agreements in India? Because that could also be part of the solution. <coughs> yes. So that's in my conclusion. I'm okay. going to talk a bit about the advanced pricing agreements. That's exactly what you were asking about. Uh, so um, typically, the income tax department in India gets in, gets the ire of uh, the taxpayers that it's extremely litigant. But what we see is the proportion of appeals that are filed by the revenue. Uh, are, are not significantly high. It's, it's the assessee and we would expect that because uh, it's not in the interest of the tax department to appeal against its own orders. So it would be that the uh, taxpayer is uh, filing most of the, uh, uh, the disputes. But, so this is more relevant to what you're asking, is that what is the rate of or what is the proportion of appeals filed by the revenue and what proportion does it really win? And this is uh, rather discomforting. What this shows is that the appeals filed by the revenue has shown a dip. But on the other hand, the appeals dismissed. So usually a case ends by saying the appeals of the assessee are or the revenue are allowed or they're dismissed or they're partly allowed. Now, where they're partly allowed, it's difficult to distinguish which appeal was allowed and which wasn't. So what we did is to say, okay, what was a show short loss for the department or the assessee would be where it's completely dismissed. And if you look at the proportion, it's extremely high for the tax department. It's losing about 70% of, of its appeals. So um, it could be that they hire inefficient or incompetent lawyers because they have a cost constraint or these are frivolous claims on taxpayers' money. On the flip side, this is the SSE. Uh, the appeals file are about, uh, there has been an increase, but those dismissed 
are less than 10 percent. So, so it's a reflection on how the system is working. So first we say that the dispute <coughs> resolution panel, it was to shrink the time period, not doing that great. We have, as we discussed earlier, the income tax department sitting in there. And to take a decision against the department itself is tough. And um, there are repeated issues and <coughs> uh, remand of issues and then a loss rate like this. So, so can I sorry, just understand the yeah. implication of that? That's saying that the tax bond is getting it wrong 90% of the time when it's taken to appeal. Yeah, yeah. So mm. for its own appeals, it loses them. So it, it seems like it's either frivolous or it is, uh, they don't get competent lawyers to fight their case. But, but from the taxpayer appeal, if when the taxpayer appeals they're losing 90% of the time, that suggests that the accuracy of their initial assessments is very low. Uh, so the taxpayer would be this. Yes. Yeah. So they, so they, uh, their, their dismissal rate is very low. Yeah. So, so, so they're making. So they get the tax department right. getting it wrong. The mm -hmm. tax department makes wrong claims, yes. but the taxpayer is able to sustain it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But this is this isn't victory, right? This is the blue mm -hmm. line. The blue line. The, the line. appeal. I'm looking at the green. Line. The green is the dismissed. So that's what I'm saying. That this is the assessee. Yeah. And the dismissal of its appeals are actually extremely low. Compared, if you look yep. uh, here, mm. the dismissal is actually very high for the tax department. Mm. So the assessee is able to sustain its uh, uh, claim, but yep. the tax department is not able to do that. But if, if, the, if the assessee is sustaining his claim, there is a big lesson for the tax department mm. as to whether it, it should just accept the claim yes. without going through the appeal process yes. if it's losing 90% of the time. Yes, uh, interesting point, and I had this conversation with the tax department, and a lot of times they feel that, you know, to raise a claim is to uh, the push or nudge the assessee to declare more incomes, which I think is extremely costly. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they've done that in cases with uh, technology companies and said that the margins improved of what they reported. But uh, I think it's a very costly way. So this is actually an indication of not, you know, it's a, it's a lesson to not do it at all. But, uh, s sorry, this may come out of discussion, but, but is there a, a, a lesson here for the tax department as to how it triages appeals and claims and determines what it should allow to go for appeal or push to appeal? Uh, actually, that would be a good thing to do to kind of, you know, bifurcate cases into where they should actually appeal and where they shouldn't. Yeah, that's <coughs> interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should look at that. I, I wonder if it's that the appeals are costly for taxpayers. Uh, they're essentially trying to put the burden on the taxpayers. Sort of the um, so it's it's costly in terms of getting an expert, but I think the expectation. So this, this chart is like an expectation, a reflection of what will happen if they go to the ITAT. The odds are so high of winning that they feel that if, even if they incur the cost of the expert, uh, the, the gains in terms of tax not paid is actually very high. So but the adjustments are huge. <laughs> it almost suggests that the, the number of appeals ought to be growing. Yes. Well, or, or that <coughs> the tax department should be conceding at an earlier stage when its internal advisors are telling it you're going to lose but this. But they shouldn't be wasting money yes. contesting what the appeal. What I'm suggesting is it, it, it may suggest that there are an awful lot of non-litigating taxpayers yeah. who are facing incorrect <laughs> claims. And, and, mm. and essentially what they're trying to do is extort more money from, yeah. from, from the, the non-litigating taxpayers. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point because a lot of targets are being set for the assessing officers. So to meet that, they might increase their audit rate, which again is harassment of the taxpayer. So uh, I think there has to be an internal metric on when they want to litigate and when they don't. How do you think this relates? I mean, during that period, the mutual agreement procedure wasn't working, and now I think hmm. it's working hmm. a lot more, uh, a lot better. How do you think that? Do you think more of the reasonable cases are being settled in in, in MAP, and therefore? more of the extreme cases are, are going to appeal? Uh, so That's one of the defining <laughs> aspects of this period in the Indian tax system, I think, that the mutual agreement procedure was really broken and, and mm -hmm. it's now working a lot better, as far as I understand. Okay, so then I'll have to probably put a structural break to see when, when we think the map worked mm -hmm. and to look at the entire case mm -hmm. period, I mean, for all the yeah, cases well, and see. Yeah, we'll probably have to use on that, yeah. but I know, remember, even the competent authority was mentioned by <laughs> the Americans, and, 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 and then there was a, 
a change to the way that the mutual agreement procedure ran a lot more mm. were, were settled through that. So I, I just wonder whether the, there's a sharper edge now that the ones that aren't settled in there are more likely to go for the taxpayer. I'm not sure. We'd have to check for that, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, going back to the point of APAs, uh, there have been about 900 applications so far and only 300 have been signed. Uh, it's not been a huge success for two reasons. One is it's very costly. And secondly, in my discussion with assessees, they believe that, you know, why go through the process when signing of the APA takes typically two years, <coughs> about 33, 34 months, <coughs> and they could actually go through the normal IAT <coughs> process and actually win the case. Uh, usually in the APAs, uh, uh, it's observed that the margins used f by the TPO uh, to calculate, uh, the margins used there are actually very high. So um, while the APA, I would think, is a good way to bypass this lengthy process, uh, it hasn't picked up significantly. Uh, block audits uh, was, of course, the other <coughs> suggestion. The, the assessment period is about three years right now, 33 months is a time bar. I think reducing that will also allow us to see a reduction in the pre-ITAT uh, uh, period in the process. Thank you. Great. Okay. So, so much, Ali. Thanks. I love this paper. I think it's really clever, really interesting, um, and I really enjoyed reading it. So thank you so much uh, for sending it. Um, <coughs> So, um, I'm going to make a few comments, say what some of the things I thought were most interesting about it. Um, and then I'm going to point to one thing that I'm not sure about that I'm hoping you can clarify. About it. Actually, no, two things. Um, one of them I just realised. Um, so let me just say, I, I, so I'm commenting on this, I'm thinking about it through a political economic lens. Mm -hmm. And some of the conversation that we've just been having is about the fact that what, what a lot of what's happening in the design of dispute settlement procedures uh, inside revenue authorities is what you might call a principal agent problem, right? You have um, one part of the revenue authority and perhaps the finance ministry who are, which is that's more connected inside India than many countries, which is trying to design a system which will work for taxpayers and revenue authority. And then you have the different incentives and motivations of the assessing offices. And quite often there's a tussle between the two. Um, and the design of the procedure is trying to uh, shape the incentives for the revenue officers, but also create a, a kind of a safety valve through which the rather, where the assessing officer is more aggressive, there's a way of trying to give the taxpayer a, a recourse to deal with that problem. Um, so w when I talk about my paper next and, and the arbitration problem, I think it's the case that sometimes governments have introduced the policy part for revenue authorities being keen on the idea of binding arbitration because it will help to rein in an overzealous uh, assessing officer, right? So, to me, a lot of the story is political economics. It's about how you design a system and that, that shapes <coughs> incentives, right? Um, and I think um, you could talk about that a bit more uh, in the way that you frame the paper. And I think you did talk about it more when you introduced the paper. But the conversation we've been having here is a lot about this question of um, uh, that substance. Um, but let me let me work through my comments. So, um, first thing I want to say, yes, I think the th there's a really clear, clear obvious question here. Um, uh, and and on the motivation, um, like I just typed uh, India tax litigation into Google and you get loads of stuff, right? Yeah. It's We all know that <coughs> it's a real reputational problem for India internationally. It's a, a real substantive issue that India is uh, has so many of these disputes. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's, my impression is it's one of the few cases where we can actually see that, that this element, that, 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 that an administrative element really af now starting to really affect him investment decisions into such a large uh, market, which is, you know, I think it's got to that level of problem for India. Um, we talked about map a bit, um, and I had a look at the map statistics, the most recent map statistics. So here's India. You have, you have the fourth biggest number of maps uh, in the world, and yet last year, in 2018, you resolved just 85 of them. So, um, but also actually not many cases going into map, just going to what uh, Michael was saying. So. Um, <coughs> want to make this internationally interesting for an audience who are not just in India, mm -hmm. I think there's two things. One is the role of India uh, and the, the relationship between India and, and, and other countries and, and, and multinational investors. And the other thing is the comparative perspective. So how does this situation compare to other countries? And I think that that's some interesting context you could give us in the paper. Um, okay. Um, 
on the dis what do I have? Here? Okay, so on the descriptive content, um, uh, the story here is the creation of uh, is the creation of a, 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 an alternative dispute resolution settlement, which is a very uh, process, which is the um, the DRP. Yeah, DRP. So now this is this is interesting. This is again something which is sort of very pertinent to current discussions. So, you know, what one thing that gives this paper a lot of relevance is the fact that dispute settlement is a major part of what's currently being discussed as part of the digital tax program at the OECD. It's very contentious, particularly because of India's position. Um, and so alternative dispute resolution is exactly where people are looking to try and find a way of brokering consensus. So the fact that this has been tried in India, and it appears from what you found to have been in some ways successful and in other ways not, I think gives this paper a real, a real pertinence. Um, but uh, it took me a while to work out what exactly th the difference is, and you, you've got some questions about it here. I think it really helped to explain a bit more about how the two different routes are designed, mm -hmm. what would affect the taxpayer's choice between going one way or another. As I understand it, if you go down the alternative dispute settlement route, mm -hmm. you get a hard timeline. Yeah. Whereas the the CIT you get a, um, a, a flexible timeline, mm -hmm. and if you go down the alternative route, only you can appeal. The revenue can't appeal. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it's much more attractive to the taxpayer, and it's interesting that you find therefore that actually often the taxpayer doesn't go down this route, even though it seems more attractive. So why that is mm -hmm. is a super interesting question. Um, so so to me this is also this also feeds into a much bigger discussion happening globally about how you can design alternative dispute resolution mm -hmm. approaches. Um, so that's that's part of the relevance. Now the methods. Um, I really, um, I really think this is interesting. I think a lot of innovative work is being done right now, uh, in legal studies and in other parts of academia using natural language processing. So even putting on side your substantive contributions, methodologically, this is really interesting. And you have this really nice appendix which shows us um, how you're approaching this. And I, I mean, I don't know how it all worked, but I know enough to know that there's an awful lot of decisions you have to make about how you're designing your natural language processing. So, so sort of a different people often talk about doing bag of words approaches mm -hmm. versus other type, and you're not doing that, you're doing something more sophisticated than that. Um, and I think that you <coughs> could again emphasize that much more and talk a bit about the methodological choices you made and what lessons you learned about how you designed it. Because I think there's going to be an awful lot of papers coming <coughs> in the future in legal studies mm -hmm. which are using this kind of method and I think this could really contribute to that a lot. Um, now, on the findings, I'm going to talk about <coughs> things I found interesting and then, and then a, a couple of doubts, right? Um, uh, okay, so the first thing that's interesting, and you talked about it, is this very clear dip here. Mm -hmm. so, so we see the, this is year of appeal here, right? So the introduction of the alternative dispute resolution, the DRP, and this big dip in the, uh, um, in the, the time taken to appeal. Um, I think that's a clear finding, and it's really interesting. And you've got, a, you know, it seems to support your hypothesis as to what's going on. Um, so the first point is that's, you know, this part of the graph, great. I'm going to come back to this part later. <coughs> um, uh, second thing, um, and you didn't talk about this, um, but the one of the the only thing I can get from your paper about why it might be that the taxpayer doesn't always go to the DRP, even though it seems much more attractive seems to be what you found about what happens, which is that it's more likely that the DRP will send cases back to be reassessed, which means a more lengthy process. Um, so actually, that it may be that there's something about, <coughs> they don't tell us about the design of the two panels, but there must be something about the design of this panel, which means in some ways it's actually more likely to do this, which means that may maybe something about the incentives or the background of the panelists here makes them less taxpayer friendly perhaps um, and so that will be something to consider. So this graph here which shows the rate of the percentage of cases going back for assessment is uh, I think I think a really substantive and important thing that you find with your analysis. Um, um, this and you, we talked about this already a lot this is a, this is amazing <laughs> this finding I mean it's just incredible when you look at it um, that the revenue authority is dismissed so often um, whereas the, uh, the it's very much the opposite for the assessor. I think that's I think this is a you know I think we kind of know this already, but to put hard numbers on it like this is really really good. Um, uh, and I just wanted to mention that Eduardo and I did a bit of work uh, a few years ago looking at treaty disputes, um, and we found this is the rate of taxpayers victory in all tax treaty disputes, and you can see that India has the lowest rate of any country in the G20. Um, so your findings fit into this other literature really well. Um, uh, so, so great. Um, 
Right, now to my question. Can I, could you have some her water, please? It's the blue bottle. Mm. Thank you. Um, right. The two caveats about the data you're using. So the first thing is, as I understand <coughs> it, we don't, what we're looking at here is cases that all get all the way to the ITEP. Mm -hmm. So we don't know about cases that go through the DRP and the CIT and are not appealed from your analysis. Is that right? Uh, we know which ones went to the ITA. Which yes. Went to the ITA, and then went, went, so these are ITAT cases. Yes. Which allows you to distinguish so, between the two. So your statistics about success rates and length of time and so on, mm -hmm. um, they only cover cases that are appealed. So, uh, and I suppose that's just a limitation of the data you're yeah. using, and that's yeah. fine. But I think you should clarify that. That actually, what you're not telling us is the length of time a case takes to get through the DRP, because your data are biased to only cases that go through the DRP and then are, and then are repeated. Um, and that may not make any difference, and the findings are still interesting, but it's definitely a limitation. But the other point I want to make is this, and I'm, I'm hoping there's a, 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 a simple answer to this. So, because I did the same kind of analysis with Eduardo, I confronted an issue, which is, the <coughs> lag time between when a case happens and when you have the data on it. So this is the data you're using. Yeah. And what we see is if this is year of assessment, we see the peak year is 2010. And after that, the figures start to decline. Yeah. And that's, as I understand it, not a substantive finding. That's simply the case that as you get closer to now, fewer cases have reached decision yeah. point oh, yeah. at the appeal mm -hmm. tribunal. Yeah. So that we can't look at this and think that's a decline in the number of cases. Mm. Similarly here, the peak year is 2014. That's yeah. the lag between <coughs> 2010 and 2014, four-year average case length. And here, for the number of pronouncements, we get a peak in 2016. Um, but we're still not at the same point here that we've got down to zero. What that means is there's a bunch of cases which are relevant to your analysis which haven't yet been decided. Right, so what that means, as I understand it, is if we look at this chart, which someone went wow when you showed it, right? So this is the decline in the variation in the duration. But there's a whole segment of this chart where we wouldn't yet know because the case wouldn't yet be decided. And if you draw, did you get your data in 2019 or 2018? 2018, so October 2018. Okay, so my line is actually higher. It should be one year lower than this. So this is, <coughs> above this yellow line, we wouldn't yet know about a case because the duration of time takes us past 2018, mm -hmm. 2019. So uh, this declining variation is purely an artifact of the data you're using. It's not a substantive finding, as I understand it. So, uh, which is why when I talk yep. about it, I, talk should about I, should have I should have given a caveat that I stop at 2011 because this would be largely the sample of cases which you know, came in and got resolved, and mm. so there's a left poor bias <coughs> yeah. for the years after that. Mm -hmm. Even if we stop at 2011, there is some kind of decline there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I see. And when you talked about it, you talked about the mean. I mean, look, it's really and it's really clear that this mean shifts down yeah. like this. And yeah. so that's a really clear. I think that's really clear finding. Um, but but yes, yeah, so that's a that's a caveat, and it, it, it works its way through other charts. Um, so in this chart, so this is um, here we see the decline. Mm -hmm. So I. I think, because of this bias, mm -hmm. I think that this dip in the blue line is a clear finding. Because assessment yeah. to appeal, we ought to know about appeals until fairly recently. Yeah. But appeal to disposal, um, I think we're less likely to be confident about this period here. So if we look at the red line, yeah. which is the total length of time, and I draw my yellow line again. So above this yellow line, we don't know. And this is an average figure. So you can see how close they are. Yeah. So there's going to be a whole bunch of cases up here that we don't yet know about, yeah. um, uh, which would drag, which once they're in there will shift the average up. So it's entirely possible that this green line might have fat run like that, I think. Mm. Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, and the same thing for this chart. Yeah. There's the yellow line. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think putting a cutoff date and justifying the cutoff date is the thing you need to do. And I think probably in these charts, you, you probably need to stop them at whatever cutoff date you, th you think you can justify based on the data. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't undermine a lot of your findings, but it does perhaps uh, temper some of the analysis about the end periods. Um, but look, it's really great. I th and like this kind of innovative data stuff is, is like, there's going to be so much of it in the future. And so this is a real path-breaking paper, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Eduardo for inviting me to your symposium. Um, I'll try to uh, fill in the blanks a little bit given the time I have. Uh, cut down of all its superstructure, basically the statistical approach is 
to think of uh, the process starting from the assessment officer and transfer pricing officer who determines the arms and price to uh, go to the CIT appeal or the DRP and that's one stage and the end of that stage is when they go to the appellate tribunal and the second stage is you go through the period the tribunal <coughs> takes to uh, dispose of the case that disposal may not however be a resolution so but it doesn't matter as long as they dispose it meaning it is resolved or it is sent back to the uh, assessing officer then you that's the part you look at and I must say that uh, this is an extremely painstaking task that the uh, uh, they have uh, undertaken because they go through the entire ETAT data set which consists of transfer pricing cases, all other income tax cases and simply through uh, information sifting they decide when transfer pricing cases are referred and they decide that this is what we will take. Then if the case is still ongoing they take them away and uh, so they take only those transfer uh, pricing cases that are disposed of. So it is um, uh, 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 an enormous task that they have taken and their approach is to check on the pre-ETAT uh, phase vis-a-vis -vis the post-ETAT that is within the ETAT the period of the case and within pre-ETAT they separate out the DRP and the uh, CIT appeals. Now the interesting thing that they pointed out which is quite correct that the DRP was introduced in 2009 as a panel of three commissioners uh, to kind of uh, as an alternative dispute resolution because taxpayers complained that it took forever at the uh, commissioner appeals uh, stage. And nevertheless, even though the, the difference in time uh, collapsed over time, <coughs> immediately after it was introduced in 2009, that uh, uh, the DRP certainly had a uh, shorter period. The reason many people were kind of wondering about it one reason is the DRP doesn't necessarily meet uh, very easily because three commissioners have to be obtained and they have to meet and this uh, uh, commission can be made up of different uh, commissioners and s second as far as the taxpayer is concerned there is really no guarantee that the same DRP will uh, be comprised again a second or a third time whereas with the CIT appeals or the commissioner appeals there is a certain certainty. So that is one reason that the DRP has not been terribly successful um, over time. And, um, and also, as uh, Suranjali pointed out, there is a certain um, the feeling of certainty within the system itself uh, from the taxpayer's point of view, whereas the uh, DRP is kind of more undefined and have to be uh, formed and uh, they have to meet from time <coughs> to time. So let me go directly now to uh, the uh, findings and of course the total duration of a TP case uh, has uh, <coughs> uh, declined and in recent years even beyond uh, the period of the uh, data set the uh, it has declined. One is it is a, a very very uh, policy directed um, uh, 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 decision of the authorities to say that if they are the same reason then the uh, uh, department <coughs> is told don't go in for it whereas earlier the um, AOs or assessment officers were completely independent to do so actually earlier than that too the higher authorities that is the um, uh, deputy commissioner commissioners principal commissioner first principal commissioner, the board, the chairman of the board, they made all kinds of decisions. Then for reasons uh, of independence um, and uh, clarity and transparency, the system was, was changed <coughs> and the decision making first recommendation was put on the assessment officer. So as a result, the power really went away from the um, higher ups so to speak and today all these higher ups complain that they do, don't have any power 
but they have a lot of benefits and uh, so it's, it's very interesting how in reality the uh, systems work and at the same time the in terms of the failure of the departmental cases relatively more assessment officers are sometimes pressured to take cautious decisions because they are the really the decision making authority and um, yet they have to be very careful about <coughs> follow up by the controller and auditor general that makes a, a review and a report on tax departments every year and the main objective and purpose of the CAG is to ask why haven't you collected more tax you could have collected more tax and therefore that is a very egregious um, kind of complaint in the early days I can recall 20 25 years ago the chairman of the board would then go to CAG and explain why it was not the case whereas now the practice over time has become that if a question is raised by the CAG the um, uh, department immediately will send out a um, uh, another demand on the taxpayer even though th as a cautious coverage even though the department knows this is not collectible as a result the assessment officer will sometimes tell the SSE ahead of time we are sending you an additional demand but you can appeal it even though we don't expect you but we have to cover ourselves for it so that is the reality of what is happening uh, even though under the uh, current tax administrations and really the policy makers these um, uh, um, shortcomings are being reduced so they are really <coughs> policy generated uh, or exogenously generated than uh, endogenously generated at least some are endogenous but much of it is exogenous the um, <coughs> the pre etap duration has not declined at the same pace as the post etat uh, because the etat anyway it has declined from about four to two years which is a correct statistic but the point as I've said is that the there is really no pressure on the um, uh, CIT appeals <coughs> on when to finish it whereas at the appeal stage the appellate tribunal which is fixed has to churn over the cases much faster so therefore uh, the ETAT uh, level or uh, stage is much faster uh, than um, uh, than the pre ETAT stage what is interesting is the reopening of cases reopening of cases again here it is very interesting that in India after uh, this process that Suranjali has described there is the High Court and the Supreme Court and if you don't like the benches on High Court and Supreme Court you can again go back to the High Court and Supreme Court so you can say this bench was not to my satisfaction and so SSEs are also covered uh, sometimes uh, in, in this process but it does lead to a never-ending uh, process in a way what uh, I think that the uh, has uh, been pointed out again quite uh, <coughs> rightly is that because the DRP returns to back to the, the uh, uh, assessing officer is higher in numbers from the cases that originated through DRP the cases that originated through the um, uh, CIT appeals they are less in number this goes to show that the DRP uh, probably is not making pronouncements and not sending cases to the ETAT that the <coughs> ETAT finds more acceptable in fact they find it less acceptable so again therefore there is a the, the difference in quality between CITA and DRP is to be obtained my last conclusion is that I found this um, paper excellent in statistical investigation and it has really data mined very carefully um, with interesting findings uh, from a very complex uh, ETAT data set which I have actually uh, mined some time earlier but I think it stops at findings what needs to be now done I think is that it should be complemented by some field realities for which I think the authors could mine the tax administration reform commission report findings 
this is a six volume 1600 page report uh, in written in 2015 and contains very comprehensive coverage on litigation and dispute resolution based on how these processes actually transpired in the field. So some of the explanations that Suranjali was giving, I find the explanations a little more comprehensive and uh, cover more uh, wider areas and more intensive areas for you to give in order to support some of your findings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody to LSE. My name is Pablo. Um, I like to believe Al Eduardo when he says that I'm a legal expert, but I'm definitely not a tax expert, right? So then I'm hoping that things that I say will be useful for the uh, and for the paper actually, and I think can contribute to the cross fertilization. So then, when I was invited, I thought, well, maybe Eduardo is inviting me not simply because. <coughs> Uh, we are close friends, but also because I have something to say based on the work that I've been doing um, in the past few years. So then what you may find interesting actually is that I've been doing something along these similar lines, but in my field of expertise in competition law and also in state aid, which is the closest I've been to tax, but doesn't make me a tax expert by uh, a mile. But anyway, I think there's some dialogue and some lessons that I've drawn from my own analysis along these same lines that I can share with you. And I think the last point that was made actually in the previous comment I think is a good way of connecting what I want to say, which is I think that the paper has great potential and I think with some tweaks or others I think it could make big improvements uh, along those lines because I think the findings are exciting. I could see myself in the painstaking effort you've, um, there is behind uh, the statistical analysis, etc. This is very carefully done and I think this is a great starting point. And I think the potential is great. I think it's something that has been appreciated by all formal commentators, but everything who picked up on, on some issues while you were presenting, actually. Uh, one question that I have, and I think keeps coming back, and when you were discussing, actually, it, I mean, it, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't avoid actually thinking about that, is the extent to which you can draw conclusions in analysis of this kind without engaging in some way with the substance of cases. So it doesn't mean, actually, um, really reading every case, etc. but I think finding some way <coughs> of systematically engaging with the substance. I think this brings me back with to what Martin was saying in a way. Well, what is going on here? Maybe we're missing something. We'll say, well, this looks like a very attractive route, but for some reason taxpayers are not taking it. So then there may be something going on that we're missing. And I think we found a way actually to code cases by reference to the substance in some way, actually, you may be able to yield more uh, favorable conclusions. And I think, and along those same lines, actually, and this is a finding that, I mean, came to mind immediately when I was reading your paper, is this sort of more attractive ways or ways of dealing with cases that are supposed to be uh, less time intensive and so on. It turns out that the advantage in terms of time turns out to be not to become a reality. Right, this is one of the things that you're saying. So for some reason, we're expecting some cases to be shorter, but the advantage in terms of time uh, is not materialized, actually, after a point. So this is the sense that I get from that. Well, what I can tell you for what it's worth is that the same thing uh, I realize in my own field of expertise, <laughs> right? So then, is a distance. I don't need to go into the details, but just to say that the European Commission, when dealing with antitrust cases, so then the usual uh, bread and butter competition law stuff, it introduced a more attractive route that the, and the expectation was that this would allow the European Commission to decide the cases in a shorter time frame. And this turned out not to be a reality. So then the, the advantage in the front time never materialized. So in a sense, there's some sort of a parallel between what you say or what I understand that you say and what I've found myself. Right? So then the immediate question that I have along those lines is, well, maybe there's something going on in terms of substance, mm -hmm. in terms of selection of cases and so on, because the issue I struggled with and the issue that made me always very cautious when drawing conclusions along those lines is, well, what is the counterfactual actually? Mm -hmm. And actually, what would the reality have been absent these alternative mechanisms given the nature of those cases, right? So this is an open question. I think that I had in paper, I could say, well, if we engage with the substance and so on in one way or the other, could be very interesting to draw, right? So this is one comment that I think strengthens that conclusion. And another issue that I found particularly interesting, I think um, it was immediately identified, I think, by everybody in the room is the issue when trying to make sense 
of the rates of success and so on. This is really interesting and this is something with which I've struggled myself. And I guess there's, I mean, you may want to deal uh, with the dark matter, as I would like to call it, in one way or the other. I think Ian identified immediately what was going with the cases that are never brought. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is one question, actually. So the self-selection issue is an interesting one, and I think there's perhaps um, scope for dealing with that in a more systematic way. And again, coding for substance in some way, I think, could, could give you, I mean, some way uh, along those lines. It could be an interesting way. And then, what I, what I was interested in is when you use the word frivolous claims. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an interesting point because I was thinking, well, maybe this is not frivolous in any way for the tax authority. Mm -hmm. This is a very rational strategy mm -hmm. of taking cases all the way, even though there are many less cases, because of everything that is left behind and because of the message that is being conveyed about being tough, etc. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I think maybe, I mean, there's... I mean, there's maybe scope for making it, it more robust in, in one way, actually, because it could be interesting. And I mean, seeing what a, a competition authority does, I think being tough or taking cases that on substance are, are worthless cases or <coughs> they, well, they don't stand a chance, but still they take the case all the way, <coughs> I think from the perspective of an authority it could be perfectly rational. There's nothing frivolous about that because I think strategically I think it makes enormous sense. So that's another point that I would say. And you were also mentioning incompetent lawyers, and I think, well, exploring that, I think, and or maybe when presenting, you could say they may be perfectly competent, but I think it's important to engage with other competing explanations, that perhaps there's the, the lawyers, I mean, who are these lawyers who advise the tax, I mean, are they former of officials, etc. I mean, I was intrigued, actually, what, I mean, what is the route, actually, who are these people who advise uh, the taxpayers, actually? Are they former officials who have accumulated a wealth of expertise and are able to transfer the, the, the expertise? So this is, these are questions that I had. And same question for the judges. Could say, well, I mean, maybe they're perfectly, I mean, government officials are perfectly competent, or the government lawyers, if they're not officials, they're perfectly competent people, but it turns out that there's one bias or the other, etc. So these are intriguing questions, and I think, I guess, I mean, my conclusion with the papers, this is great, this is the sort of stuff that I'm doing, there's more, much more stuff to be done, I think, and it would be great, actually, to see this paper flourish, and hopefully what we've been discussing here will, will help you along those lines. So I propose mm -hmm. to put an end to my comments here, if there's a chance for you to, to react on that, but thanks very much again. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot. response? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for all the comments, and I think uh, Martin was very clever to pick up the statistical stuff. Uh, I, had to, I should have caveated that in the paper. Uh, when I do talk about the conclusions, I, I do look at the numbers only till 2011. Uh, maybe just uh, stating that up front. And uh, Dr. Shom gave a lot of inputs uh, from the administration side because he's worked with the committee and he, he has answers for some of the numbers. The shortcoming is that a lot of times it's hard to get information on the descriptive stuff. Uh, so while I do present, this is the first presentation of what the timelines look like, what are the case outcomes. There's obviously <coughs> a lot of questions that I have and I have been going back to the tax department to ask why do I see this, but there is no official document which says that this is why and this is what happened. So I think in my follow-on work, which uh, a lot of you have preempted, is that mm -hmm. to go and do a survey. So I, I, I'm now looking at why people are not looking at APAs, what's the problem with map process. So uh, the numbers are just to rile the taxpayers to give some <coughs> answers. And uh, of course, um, I, I, I mean, I did conjecture that maybe there aren't competent <laughs> lawyers. <laughs> uh, should have not said that. <laughs> well, um, we could do an analysis on picking up names of lawyers. Who, who represented the tax department and those who represented the SSE and see a pattern there and whether these are uh, repeatedly the same people, uh, what have they been their affiliations. But it's always tough to uh, uh, present numbers on that because it all, it's very intimidating for the lawyer community as well. <laughs> so I have kept away from that but probably could do that like without naming names, could look at patterns and decipher why we see what we see. Thank you very much.